So I'm really excited to, to see you all here. Um, and again, this is an hour long workshop shop titled Celestial Wayfinding. My name is Willie Lempert. So in reflecting on the Assign in Space project, we'll, we will engage in activities um, that explore how intelligent extraterrestrials might imagine language and spatial mapping in radically different ways. We will center um, non-Western perspectives that understand the celestial as neither alien nor outer. The workshop is grounded within anthropologically informed aspects of Polynesian wayfinding, nomadic spatial orientation, and how language itself structures what can be communicated. And throughout, we'll relate our discussions to examples from science fiction stories that bring speculative possibilities of SETI to life. So a little bit more about myself. I'm an assistant professor of anthropology at Bowdoin College in Brunswick, Maine. And my work on outer space is at the intersection of cultural anthropology, critical native studies, and SETI. I've conducted years of ethnographic field work in Northwestern Australia with indigenous media organizations. And my research engages tensions between the production of films that vividly imagine thriving indigenous futures and the broader defunding of Aboriginal communities and organizations. I've also engaged with indigenous filmmakers from around the world working within science fiction genres, many of which engage speculative alien encounters. And this ethnographic research informs my current work on how critical engagements with settler colonial histories and indigenous futurisms can foster reimaginings of the current era of outer space projects. So drawing on indigenous futurist scholarship and media, I consider the ongoing projects of colonization as they extend beyond earth, often drawing upon historical analogies. So in this first section, I'll tell you a little bit how, about how I initially came uh, to engage with SETI and what I have been writing and thinking about in relation to some relevant topics um, for today. I have perhaps an unusual approach to these topics, I would say. And so it'll help, I think, to understand my thinking and how I came to be involved. Uh, so the origin of my involvement is that I participated in a working group for SETI's 2018 conference called Making Contact. And this focused on indigenous studies and we were asked to write a working paper on what SETI might be missing in their approach and framework. So they, they posed this really nice open question. I worked alongside Kim Talbert, David Shorter, and Sonia Adelaide in this group, and I, I learned so much from and with them in, in this context. It led to rich discussions, including a conference panel and a special issue of journal articles. And the article I ended up writing for that series was titled From Interstellar Imperialism to Celestial Wayfinding. So here I detail how space projects represent sort of unbroken continuations of the logics and processes around resource and settler colonialism as well as alternative ways in which outer spaces and beings might be imagined, discussing Polynesian wayfinding as a framework for frontier exploration and navigation that is highly technical, yet does not rely on imperialism. This is something I'll describe today in relation to celestial wayfinding. And one of the most surprising things I discovered was the clear lineage between ancient Roman land decrees and the history of treaty making and breaking from North America, um, to Canada, to New Zealand, to Antarctica, and to outer space. So there's this real continuity that includes quite similar rhythms of declaring areas to be communal and then underutilized, which then sets the sort of legal stage uh, for the process of un undoing treaties and making settlement and resource claims. So I also explore how prime directives, much like in Star Trek, in practice have not protected indigenous people, but have made conquest possible, which is something we might consider uh, beyond Earth as well. So in another piece titled Phrenology in Space, I, I draw connections between imagined hierarchies of extraterrestrial intelligence with phrenology, the highly discredited practices of measuring skulls to determine mental traits that you might have heard about. I detail how both create hierarchies based on applying sort of selective evidence within culturally specific models. And I focus on interrelated logic between like Fermi's paradox, the Drake equation, um, the Great Filter, and the Kardashev scale. And I end up suggesting an alternative framework for resolving Fermi's paradox that relates to the self-defeating consequences of imperial expansionism itself. A couple other things, I'm also an international board member for the Ethno ISS project, a collaborative ethnographic study of the International Space Station. And more broadly, I, you know, I've written a bit about the ways in which Western cosmologies, imaginations, and legal structures tend to imagine outer space as cold emptiness, separating material objects. 
And this, you know, it sounds strange to say, but this is really an outlier framework in the broader context of the vast majority of human societies, which in a multitude of different ways relate to celestial domains that are animated by spirits and beings that are intimately interconnected with human relationships. This is the case again with Polynesian wayfinders, for example, who continue to have some of the most sophisticated navigational practices. So to reiterate, in the context of thousands of societies, Western notions of objects in empty space is a real outlier. In the vast majority of humanity, aliens in outer space are neither other nor outer. So what we often might imagine as aliens might otherwise be understood as relatives or spirits or beings that are integrated within the cosmos and with the heavens as much you know, being an inner space as an outer space. So in considering this assign in space a project, a wonderfully provocative you know, art engagement around receiving a message from other beings, I'd like to hold, first to hold together one broad question to think with, which is what does it do to our own thinking on space projects if we center indigenous perspectives that better represent our species relationship with the cosmos? So this next broad section will be focusing on mapping and we'll start with an activity. So wherever you are on any piece of physical paper, if you can draw a map of our solar system that includes interplanetary highways between earth and other planets. We'll take about three minutes, three minutes. Um, we'll do a quiet sketch, um, nothing fancy. Just focus on the placement of planets and those pathways. So wherever you are with that, just kind of put that to the side. Um, and it was important that we did that before I show you uh, this next part, but we are gonna come back to that. Um, so now to denaturalize the way that we tend to imagine map making in the context of space, I wanna take us back to something that's seemingly very unrelated in, in history, which I promise will connect in, in a meaningful way very shortly. So in 1768, James Cook and his crew left England on the HMS Endeavour. This voyage was ostensibly a scientific expedition to measure the transit of Venus in Tahiti, which was part of this global project to calculate the distance between the Earth and the Sun, which they did to a, a remarkably um, accurate um, degree. Um, but soon after doing so, they landed in New Zealand and Australia, initiating centuries of settler colonialism and just after measuring the solar distance through the transit of Venus, they took aboard a Tahitian navigator named Tupaya to join the crew. Um, you know, he, was a, he was a priest as well as this amazing navigation um, you know, expert in the region. And so on board, Tupaya drew a map of the Pacific, which was one of the first Polynesian depictions on European paper at all. And it came to be known as Tupaya's map, which you see here. And what's interesting is that initially, um, I mean, James Cook himself had a sense that it was, there's more to it perhaps, but it was generally misinterpreted as inaccurate. And it has since been reevaluated in great depth as a work of cartographic genius. People have gone through and done the math and geography um, to really explain this, um, but it translates Polynesian geographies of exploration into Western framework. It doesn't make sense in the context of latitude and longitude lines at right angles or absolute directions based on the North Pole. However, it does make perfect sense when imagined from the point of view of how space was understood and navigated by Tahitians and other Polynesian wayfinders with the actual center of the island or the volcano origin itself as both the center and North in the map. So in this way, the ship itself becomes the North with the islands imagined as sort of moving toward the ship as the navigator beckons them through wayfinding techniques. And this map imagines the endeavor as the true north itself, which is a moving target and which sits in relation to other islands based not on an absolute distance um, way of thinking, but through practical considerations of how long and through what conditions, winds and currents the voyages would entail. So here I'll, I'll give you examples, uh, you know, to put this in more context, this is the sort of more standard map of Polynesia, where you have the longitude and latitude at right angles. Uh, and this is how, you know, James Cook imagined and was mapping the region. And then you have, again, Tupaya's map, 
you know, this is, um, you know, what I just showed you. And then what people have gone through and um, verified in, in great depth, and if you're interested in um, being in contact, there's been whole, you know, huge, um, you know, articles and, and special issues devoted to this. There's the connection between all of these islands seemingly doesn't relate to this, but if one imagines it from the Polynesian framework, it looks like this and it makes perfect sense um, in the context of the, the islands being the center. And so, you know, there's practical considerations of like winds, conditions, basically how you would sail rather than the absolute distance between them is really what, um, you know, that, that is speaking to. So again, it's this and this are the same thing in different ways. And what, what I'll ask you to do, ask the following question of yourself and each other, to, to what extent does your map follow the logics of Western mapping of Polynesia or Tupaya's map, your map of the solar system that you created? Uh, so what I'm guessing is that um, you didn't have a sort of North Pole that oriented your map of the solar system, that like wayfinders, you imagined either the sun or earth similarly as the center reference point. And you may have even had planets lined up or drawn their orbits or even had them in various places in orbit. Uh, but since planets move, what matters in space travel are the various conditions and timings for moving between them, similarly to Tupaya's map. Uh, while absolute orbit distances, they, they lose practical meaning in the context of a specific voyage. Um, and so, you know, I would suggest, and I think there's, there's some logic to um, star maps likely following the logic of Tupaya's map, rather than maps of Earth, which impose two dimensions onto three dimensions, and turn our planet into a sort of flat grid with right angles of longitude and latitude. Um, there's no singular and meaningful North Pole in space, only relational voyaging. Um, and even if there are North Poles or, or thinking about the you know, certain galaxies or, um, or yeah, like the, the Milky Way, for example, we probably will engage through relational voyaging. Um, so rather than an ocean interspersed with occasional islands, Tupaya's map conveyed a sort of sea of islands. And if you can imagine, likewise, the implications of maps in our solar system and beyond um, as a sea of planets and stars um, that beckon celestial bodies toward the ship through navigational techniques. And so I also want to just briefly speak to um, some other aspects of, um, of, of navigation and spatial movement that relate to nomadism. So quickly, it's important to distinguish between absolute and relative direction. Um, and I'll I'll put up this image, which I, I really love um, and it says a lot. Relative directions imagine the perspective of an individual moving through space who can move left, right, up, down, et cetera, depending on the way that they are already headed or facing. Whereas absolute directions imagine individuals from above going a particular direction based on a sort of true north. And so in the area I've spent many months in Aboriginal communities in Western, the Western desert of Australia, Relative direction really has no traditional meaning. There aren't words to describe left or right. There are only absolute directions, which are very precise. And people imagine themselves looking down from above and the landscape as well with, with a very high fidelity. Um, and this is demonstrated in mapping, sand drawings, acrylic paintings, descriptions of how to get to places. It's embedded within the language, which we'll talk more about. Uh, but it's interesting to imagine different ways that space navigation will ultimately think about absolute versus relative orientation. Because beyond the context of Earth, sort of neither these absolute or relative ways of getting around and thinking about space on Earth quite work. And you know, perhaps the relational wayfinding techniques might be the ones that most closely approximate what will make sense intuitively and practically um, in space as, as people travel more and more. An image I want to show you is of the dark emu, because um, you know, furthermore, Aboriginal people in the Western Desert often travel by stars at night. And what many imagine as constellations of stars are for them animated with story, purpose, beings, and ancestors. So even light and darkness that itself can be imagined differently. So for example, the dark emu shown here is especially important. And in this image, then it's the negative space in the Milky Way is not simply nebula blocking areas toward the center of our galaxy, 
but it evokes a series of important connective stories in addition to navigational information. So now to take a huge step back, these are examples from Earth by contemporary fellow human societies, which coexist with societies that are sending up rockets, satellites, and space stations, and which listen for intelligent extraterrestrials and you know, include SETI, et cetera. But you know, something I think that's important to think about is that even if even these differences I've mentioned today start to push our limits of, of our imaginations, you know, consider the potential scope of differences for beings that are not only non-human, but perhaps radically different than we can imagine regarding the nature of life and intelligence and not to mention time and space. If, for example, what if they breathe once every thousand years? Or what if a sentence takes 10,000 years to utter? What if they have no sense of individuality nor any desire for communication at all? So on this note, I wanna to shift toward our next major topic of discussion around language and dive into some grounded examples. So, um, I don't know if, if folks have seen Arrival. It's a really, you know, quite incredible film. Um, and it's also a wonderful short story that I actually just recently read for the first time titled The Story of Your Life by Ted Chiang. Really moving and it's like 40 pages. It, it's very dense and, and incredible. Um, so without spoiling the film too much, and I, you know, I just recommend seeing it regardless. Um, for our purposes, essentially there are alien creatures that visit Earth whose language is not only difficult to decode, and lacking any sort of Rosetta Stone for translation, but it's also depicted as changing the thought process of those who can understand it. It becomes a peacemaking tool whereby the medium is the message. And you know, the film relates to this linguistic anthropological theory known as the Worf Sapir hypothesis. And this is a theory developed by Edward Sapir and Benjamin Lee Worf that suggests that the structure of a language determines or greatly influences the modes of thought and behavior in the culture in which it is spoken. The strong version of this theory is that the qualities of language deeply structure what can and cannot even be thought. So this theory has been highly debated for years, including many shades of gray, but just for our, our short time and purposes here today, let's stick with the hardcore version of this theory for just a moment together. So I'll show you some examples that relate to color. Um, which of course consists of a spectrum of electromagnetic waves within the human sensory range. And these are categorized differently depending on cultural context. So for example, in the US, light red is often imagined as categorically different as the color pink. While in Russia, there is a categorical distinction regarding light blue. And such categories have social implications. For example, many of us associate blue with boys and pink with girls, especially you know, for little kids in clothes. However, this was an, a process of intentional marketing, and a century ago or so, these two associations were just inverted. So pink or light red is not only categorically different from red, but this distinction also carries significant social meaning. Um, there's also a great episode of Star Trek The Next Generation called Darmok that engages some related ideas. So in this episode, while Captain Picard has a literal translator for the meaning of individual words, what he and his crew come to realize is that the alien species speak in metaphor only, rather than literal or direct meaning. And that to truly speak fluently with the Temerians, they will not only need to understand their language, but also their entire mythology. Um, it's a really cool Star Trek episode that, that gets into the limits of language and understanding and how it's, it's often not enough just to understand the meaning of individual words, but the framework um, that it's being explained through and the references that, that are embedded. So next, this is the pioneer, um, or the etchings that were marked into the pioneer 10 and 11 spacecrafts. And I wanna show this because we might severely underestimate how difficult it will be to communicate even the most seemingly simple gesture. So as an example, you know, in Pioneer 10 and 11 spacecrafts, there was you know, a spirited debate that some of you might know about on what gesture was universally welcoming. However, this is fundamentally based on a bipedal great ape species with hands who use tools and weapons. And so showing an open palm kind of demonstrates, you know, not being armed and, and something in that context. But, you know, would that mean something radically different in a different context with a different sort of biology or morphology? And, you know, even the human universal facial, facial uh, gesture of friendliness, like the smile, 
For other great apes, that's a sign of teeth bearing aggression. And that's for the species in the universe. If it's by the you know, four species that are by far the most similar to us. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, they're nearly identical. And yet our, our primary welcoming sort of facial expression is taken the opposite of how you know, we might mean it. So I also wanna um, take us back to this idea of collectivism versus individualism. And my previous speculative question of, you know, what if aliens have no sense of individuality nor any need for communication? And I'll describe a specific scenario to ground this. So um, these are two books um, I really love, or, you know, a book and a short story. So first I'll highly recommend The Three-Body Problem. I have it right on my window here. Um, it's the first in a trilogy of books that engage issues of extraterrestrial intelligence, in terms of collectivism and many other SETI related aspects in imaginative and sophisticated ways. And its cultural touchstone is the cultural revolution in China. And it's uh, orig originally written um, in Mandarin and so starts off from a different perspective and just incredible books. So if for folks interested in going down this rabbit hole, I, I really recommend reading those. I wanna ground our engagement in the context of a story by Ursula Le Guin who's also on, on my nightstand, who I really love in my office. Um, wonderful sci-fi novelist and the daughter of a famous, you know, two famous anthropologists, Alfred and Theodora Kroeber. So I want us to think with her short story titled Vaster Than Empires and More Slow. So in this story, humans visit a planet that seemingly only has vegetation. They come to learn that a collective of all of its grasses and plants form one single consciousness, as though each plant is a neuron of an emergent planetary brain, which is not totally unlike the Gaia theory popularized by James Lovelock in the 70s. And so since this collective intelligence has never had an other to interact with, it doesn't have any context for not only human, but any kind of contact. And instead, it ends up mirroring whatever humans project onto it making it fearful, anxious, and angry, which is because basically humans are projecting that within the story because they are themselves frightened and confused. A lot of things happen in that story and I, and I recommend it, but let's leave it at that level of description for now and move to our next activity. And so I'd like for us to all spend just three minutes um, writing about how to answer the following questions. It's a sort of choose your own adventure. So it's the broader question of, do you think it is ethical to try to communicate with such a solitary um, collective intelligence that, that's alien? So if no, perhaps write or think a little bit about why not. And if yes, consider how would you attempt to do so? And remember, this is not the Borg or something humanoid, but imagine Le Guin's world of a single collective plant intelligence that mirrors human emotion. Um, so. We'll take three minutes just to write or think on this. Okay, so um, hopefully you had you know some time to to think and write a little bit about that. And this time, why don't, you know, for folks who feel comfortable turning on their screens, um, why don't everyone um, turn on your screen um, who's comfortable with that? And before moving on, I wonder if, if anyone wants to share anything just briefly about, you know, whether they thought no or yes, and if so, how to do so. Um, so yeah, were, were there any ideas that anyone would like to just briefly share in relation to this thinking speculative activity? Um, so yeah, I think we have a hand, so yeah, please, please go ahead. I had a hard time, like, deciding, just making an argument for how it wasn't ethical, though, like, to try to communicate, though I felt like maybe it would be unethical to expect a response or expect to be heard or, like, expect, feel entitled to some reaction or something, and with regard to, like, how to communicate, I was thinking, like, less language more like biophotons or like molecular information packets or something so like maybe just like sort of sitting there and letting some sublingual communication happen um, via like the chemistry of the situation 
if you were actually physically present with someone as opposed to like at a long distance. So I wouldn't expect my language to be particularly useful, but maybe just my presence or like some of the phys physical interactions would be its own communication. That's a really cool answer. And I don't know if you've read the short story that Arrival is based on, but they they kind of connect on sharing approaches to thinking about physics and sort of fundamental things um, that aren't particularly connected to feelings. That's a that's a really cool perspective on that. Um, so thanks. Other other thoughts that people had about any direction with this question. Hi, can I talk? Please, yeah, go ahead. I'm in the car. That's why my video is not on. Yeah, uh, but I something I was thinking about is. Um, that one reason it might be ethical to try to communicate is because if you don't try to communicate, then you have no way of understanding what they might need or want or what this being might need or want. And I think that some attempt to communicate is probably better than just assuming that you know what this thing needs or wants. And if, if and another thing I was thinking of a way that you might try to communicate, which is kind of similar to what the previous person said is, um, you could try exposing it to other life forms from Earth other than humans. Like what if there was a safe way of exposing it to some sort of life plants or life, you know, or uh, I don't know, some other life form on Earth and see if maybe they have a better interaction than humans and this thing that thing do. Because other life forms have other ways of communicating that we sometimes aren't even aware of. So that's my idea. That's, I mean, there's so much to like what you're saying. And yeah, like the, the assumption goes, as you say, both ways, like not communicating leads to a different set of assumptions that get made. But yeah, thank you. That was great. So I appreciate those comments. And, um, you know, I think, you know, the important thing to me and, and how I've been thinking about these things is to consider the ethics of whether it's appropriate to engage intelligences and to be more than anything really radically honest with one another and ourselves regarding why we are doing so without taking these motivations for granted. Um, and I want to sort of leave us moving toward the end of our workshop with um, kind of a, a question to, to muse on moving forward, which is also to think about history and, and intentions. Um, that considering that in the context of human histories of colonial contact on earth, where it has virtually always gone disastrously for at least one side, how should we imagine justifications and motivations for contacting extraterrestrial intelligent life? Or more simply, why might we desire alien contact? And sort of how does that connect to our, our histories? And, and I'm certainly not saying that, that we shouldn't but mainly to just suggest that we shouldn't take these questions for granted or that they go without saying, or that um, the need to do so is sort of, um, requires no explanation, that, that it's obvious. There's something valuable about articulating this in depth to ourselves that makes the process of doing it or not doing it more meaningful and intentional. Um, and so in, in this last section, what I wanna do is uh, show you an example of a short video that imagines a nonviolent alien encounter, which is really quite rare in cinema. And this, uh, you know, so in cinema it usually imagines, you know, frontier violence um, or its military or its background specter through the military. So if you think about all the sort of alien contact films you could think of, there's very rare few where this is not the case. So even, even in the deeply thoughtful film Arrival that we've been chatting about, the military is on like this hair trigger to alert, hair trigger alert to attack the alien ships, like to, to launch the nukes and everything. And even in a sort of buddy alien film like um, E.T., the implication is sort of there that bad things would happen to E.T. if the government actually, you know, caught them. Um, so what I want to show is just a three minute animation by Anishinaabe filmmaker Lisa Jackson called The Visit. And I want you to know just like in this very short film that there's this peaceful interaction with the flying saucer as well as a way in which the UFO is not alien and other, but kind of integrated within the cosmology of the film's characters um, and embedded within constellations and, and the cosmos. It was in the evening that I got home from uh, someplace. And I told my wife, oh, something's up, dogs are barking in the 
in a strange way. Said my wife is waking me up. She said our girl is calling you in the next bedroom. I couldn't sleep. It was a restless night. And amongst the stars, there was one bright star and it twinkled. You know how the sky moves at night? The stars? All of them moved except this one bright, pretty star. And sure enough, there was a strange light out there. You could see the saucer, the saucer shape. And then we woke up everyone. What do you do when you see something like this? We phoned the police. On my way out here, he said, when I entered the reservation line coming in from the east, the ground just lit up on the left side, like daylight. And he said, I found that very strange already. And he said, now I'm looking at this. So he was questioned us up on what we seen to make his report. And he left after that. I told my wife, I'm going to see, try something here. So I prayed a little bit, I lit sweet grass and I started singing. And when I started singing, that thing started getting brighter and brighter as I sang. And when I stopped singing, started fading again. So I'd left it like that for a while, and then I started singing again. And they said, it's getting brighter again, it's getting brighter again. Have you ever seen one? So I like to show that I, one of the nice things is it's short so we can watch it briefly together, but also it, it's showing something that is very rare in cinema where there is a sort of like nonviolent um, engagement with an alien that um, it is about connection um, and it's not, there's no specter of sort of colonial violence. Um, and the assumption that that is the main thing going on um, is, is something to think about, like why that pervades so much of the science fiction and even the discussions about um, what ET contact might actually be like. So um, if you're interested, I'll direct you to a blog um, that I update on medium.com titled um, Native Sci-Fi Film Future. Specifically, um, if you wanna have a look at other short streaming videos that are on the archive of indigenous science fiction shorts. So I will put that in the chat. Um, so there, there's one film in there called The Sixth World. That's a short film by a Diné filmmaker, Nanaba Becker. Uh, it describes a Navajo-led trip to settle Mars based on a Navajo prophecy about the future. It's also another great animated short called The Peacemaker Returns that centers the history and speculative interstellar future of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Um, so I'll also send you a link to a site where you can engage. Um, you can look at, you know, if you want to, dive deeper into the articles and discussions that, that I mentioned. Are there any questions or things that are on anyone's mind to just discuss a little bit further? It is interesting to start thinking about um, how it, it's kind of hard to think of films where at least the specter of violence, I mean, there's really interesting films like, um, you know, like Arrival or, you know, there's many, but there aren't that many that don't imply a sort of assumption of colonial fr frontier violence. So, and often these end up being sort of films that are oriented towards kids or like the animation that I just showed you. So um, there, there is that connection. So thank you so much. If there's other parts of that questions, please feel free to put it in the chat. And um, was there another hand that I saw? Uh, yes, hi, Willie Makesh here. Hey. Yeah. Uh, Right. It, I uh, unfortunately I can't remember many of the films I've watched, which are uh, peaceful in quotes there. Uh, but there's two aspects to this that I'm 
sort of trying to work out how to integrate. Yeah. Uh, one is that within the American, the US context, or rather North American context, ever since the late 40s, there has been a series of quasi-fictional books. I'm calling them quasi-fictional because they're presented as sometimes non-fiction and so on, about alien contact. I believe George Adamski, for example, was one of the first people to actually write about alien contact. He had long conversations every weekend with them, went for walks with them. Uh, you've also got a whole series of people after that who uh, reported similar meetings. Now, a couple of other things is that um, if you look at the numbers, about 125,000 people in the world, almost all of them in North America and the US states in particular, claim to have had sex with aliens. Right now, that seems sort of peaceful. But we sort of take that a little bit further. And then there's the entire set of UFO based religions, where there's a whole bunch of people who keep saying they've had alien contact and had revelations from them. How do you integrate this into the, 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 the sort of narrative you're providing in terms of colonial violence? Because these are mainstream reports, supposedly, rather than anything that's indigenous or non-Western. It's yeah. a wonderful question. I mean, the first thing I would say is it's something that I know a bit less about. So I'd be, you know, I won't, I won't overstate my understandings, but I, you know, I've really focused on the role of science fiction in cinema by indigenous and mainstream, you know, filmmakers, as well as how things get framed through science communities, thinking about, you know, SETI and ETI. But I think this is a really good point. There's, there's a great book called, I think, American Cosmic that is sort of connected to this about like the, the rise of, you know, alien engagements in the cosmos as a sort of new American religion. And I think that's right. There's all these sort of encounters people are having. I guess the one thing that comes to mind for me, and I, I would love to learn more about this because I don't, I don't know this, this world in, in great depth, um, is just to say that, you know, the framework that people are engaging through the idea of abduction, which was something that happened a lot in the sort of, you know, um, you know, wars in North America, you know, after contact, you know, abduction and um, like the, the, the way that even the language around it, I think kind of frames it, even if it's not violent, it, it frames it at least in a potentially adversarial way from the beginning, whereas, um, you know, like, you know, those SNL skits where there's like, you know, some people you know, have these like horrific thing or like these like peaceful encounters and then Kate McKinnon's like, that's not how it went for me. Um, it's kind of like the, the frameworks that inhabit the alien interaction are people are, even if they're speaking against those, they kind of exist as, th there's the assumption that it could have been violent and it stands out that it wasn't. And that's noteworthy rather than sort of celestial, perhaps ancestors or things like that. So. If there's anything else you think of, I'd love if you have anything to read to learn more about those sort of communities and experiences. It's, it's something I, I know less about. And um, and I hope that this has kind of helped us all like think a little bit together about the importance of considering whose worldviews are centered and engaging outer space and contact with intelligent aliens. I appreciate you joining. Thank you for your time and have a wonderful morning, afternoon or, or night.